Welcome to another episode of Cancer Specialist Medical Minute. With Dr. Rick and Dr. Danny. That's Dr. Rick. And that's Danny and I'm excited and we are excited to be back for another episode. We're super excited and we're well rested, right Rick? We just got back from our retreat. Exactly, yep. The uh, company went down and we talked about the state of affairs and it was a good time and I don't know about you but I'm not well rested so that, that doesn't apply to me. Yeah, I was lying about that. We actually had... Had quite the uh, quite the meeting all day Saturday, but we got out to the golf course on Sunday, which was pretty exciting, pretty fun. Yep, uh, beautiful out there. Uh, unfortunately, the golf was not compliant with the weather. We had our ups and downs, that's for sure. Well, let me start this uh, episode out with uh, another dad joke, Rick. Love it. Sign me up. Let's go. All right. Why couldn't the bicycle stand up? Something about a kickstand, but I don't know where you're going with it. It was too tired. Oh, all right, never mind. Well, I whiffed on that one. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Not bad. Not bad. Give me one more. All right. Let's see. I like when you put him on the spot and he has to (laughs) quickly read his his book. Just pick one at random. (laughs) What do you call a boomerang that doesn't work? What do you call a boomerang that doesn't work? Boomer rung didn't I don't know what you got a stick. <laughs> so right anyway, like uh, this episode is about hematology. Uh, I'll admit this is one where I probably won't lend a too too much to the expertise. I think my the majority of my hematology knowledge was what I learned in medical school. But uh, thankfully, Danny, you are a uh, expert in this topic, correct? I am an expert, Rick, but don't downplay your expertise for hematology because you do treat hematology patients as well. I do. No, I okay. do. I do. Right. But you are the you are the ins and outs, especially when it comes to uh, benign hematology, which we'll get into. But no, I, I'm actually just excited to sit back, drink some d- ice cold Dunkin' Donuts, and listen to Shout you. Shout out go Dunkin' on. Donuts. We don't have an official sponsorship yet, but hopefully soon. It turns out I've been officially sponsoring them since college, so. <laughs> True. Yeah, so one day we'll get a call, but for now we'll dive into the world of hematology. So, So yeah, Danny, real quick, just kind of big picture for listeners is I think a lot of people view you as a medical oncologist, which you obviously are, but also part of your board certification process for most folks, at least in oncology, is to also be a hematologist. Can you go through sort of how the training's divided up between the two and the board process and kind of how it is you guys become, most of you guys are board certified in both. Yeah, sure, Rick. So most fellowships fellowships nowadays are both uh, split up into hematology and medical oncology where you do uh, pretty much half your training in hematology and that includes both uh, hematologic disorders, which are not cancer, and then uh, you know hemato- hematologic disorders, which are m- malignant, and we're talking about leukemias, lymphomas, and some other rare types of cancer. So, um, when we're in our training programs, um, our months get split up. Uh, some months we do uh, in oncology and certain uh, cancer subtypes, and then the hematology months get split up between. Uh, consults we take in the hospital, we have months that are dedicated to uh, seeing consults in hematology versus, you know, seeing a patient with new diagnosis of breast cancer. We're going to see a patient with a low platelet count or anemia or a patient that's bleeding or a patient that might have a blood clot. So uh, these are things that hematologists treat on a day-to-day basis and uh, we learn how to manage all those conditions in our fellowship program. And then we, we also spend a good amount of training on the malignant side of hematology, and that's treating different types of leukemia. Uh, lymphomas are lumped into hematologic malignancies. Uh, they start, um, lymphomas develop uh, in lymph nodes and sometimes also can be in the bloodstream. And we, we learn how to treat them with different drugs like chemotherapy. We also... Um, learn about bone marrow transplant and how how that treatment modality can um, help patients with hematologic cancers such as leukemia lymphoma. So that's kind of how our fellowship programs are, are split up. We, um, after fellowship, you kind of make a, a decision whether to go into a specific specialty within hematology and oncology and 
some people, once they finish fellowship, decide to go into a um, academic or, uh, you know, medical center where they get a job and they only treat leukemia or they only treat lymphomas. Um, we're in a practice where we treat all different types of cancer, and that includes leukemias, lymphomas, and uh, what, what I consider solid malignancies like breast cancer, lung cancer, etc. So um, in this practice, I chose to, to join because we have the ability to treat, you know, really any patient that comes in with any uh, blood or cancer diagnosis. So, um, you know, getting into the differences between benign and malignant hematology, there's, there's big differences. I think on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of our consults in the hospital tend to be uh, about what we consider benign hematology consults. So there might be a patient who comes through the ER who um, is anemic and needs a blood transfusion. And, you know, there might be a question of why that patient's anemic. And so we're, we're consulted on those cases. And then uh, there may be a patient who comes in with a blood clot, blood clot in their leg or blood clots in the lungs. And we give a device on how to manage situations like that. What would you say the most I mean, you mentioned too, most common things you see in the hospital are from a benign hematology standpoint. Yeah, I think the most common consult for a hematologist in the hospital is uh, thrombocytopenia or low platelet count. Um, and then, you know, also probably in the coronavirus uh, pandemic, we saw a lot of blood clots. So a lot of deep vein thromboses, which are blood clots in the um, veins that are in the legs or even uh, can be uh, really anywhere in the body. Um, and we see a higher prevalence of those or a higher incidence of those blood clots in patients who were diagnosed with COVID-19. So we definitely treated a lot of those throughout the pandemic uh, using blood thinners to prevent further clot formation and to help patients uh, overcome those diagnoses. So yeah, commonly in the hospital, it's going to be low blood count uh, consult that most commonly is a low platelet count, um, could be anemia, low, which corresponds to a low hemoglobin level. And um, we definitely see a lot of blood clots as well. You know, I think that important for patients to know when they, when they come to our clinic and we get this question all the time, and you kind of mentioned this in the beginning of our talk, is that you see you're seeing a, a doctor from cancer specialists in North Florida. Just because you see that on our code doesn't mean that you have to be scared that you have a new cancer diagnosis. And I, I get that question or that comment all the time saying, you know, when I saw the referral come in and I'm seeing a cancer specialist, you know, most patients worry that they're being referred for a type of cancer even though a majority of the time when they're sent from their primary care doctor, it's for uh, a different diagnosis. And so I, I try to re reassure patients that we definitely treat a lot of these uh, benign blood disorders and we're, we're experts in treating those. You know, we, we have to do the appropriate workup uh, for each one. So what, um, how, do, how do you determine who, like let's say you see a patient in the hospital for one of those things you mentioned, how do you determine who needs to see you in the clinic versus is this something their primary care doctor can manage? Is there specific thresholds? Is it a case by case basis? What are some of the things that you think about when you make a recommendation for a patient to follow you uh, as an outpatient once they get out of the hospital? Yeah, good question. So for blood clots, um, I usually treat patients to the point of when they're coming off their, their blood thinner. So there's a certain length of time that we treat patients with a blood thinner to lower the risk of a clot forming in the future. Um, once a patient's had one blood clot, they're at risk of more blood clots. So we keep patients on a blood thinner, usually at least three to six months. And then after that period of time passes, we decide, does a patient need to continue on a blood thinner uh, longer term or even lifelong? And so for, for that type of consult, I, I see patients usually at least six months uh, up to a year. And then if we take them off the blood thinner, I have them follow up with their primary care physician and see us back only if they need to. Um, if a patient is going to be a blunt, on a blood thinner the rest of their life, I, I usually see them uh, every six months to once a year uh, just to make sure they're stable, they're not having any complications from the blood thinner. If it is for an anemia diagnosis or low blood counts, 
Um, we see patients intermittently. It depends on if we are actually making some kind of treatment recommendation or not. Um, usually patients where we're not actively making a, a treatment recommendation, we see them once or twice a year just for monitoring. There are certain conditions which need treatment and there's autoimmune conditions which can lower your platelet count or even patients have breakdown of their blood cells because their immune system uh, is, is overactive. And those are some conditions that are, they're not cancerous, but they need treatment by us. And we see them and uh, give our treatment recommendations. And we may follow those patients long term and see them every few months or even shorter frequencies. So it really varies person to person and what the case is. You know, going going into if we have a patient with a hematologic cancer, and that could be a, a leukemia, it could be a lymphoma, you know, we're seeing those patients more frequently on average. Uh, it depends if they're on treatment or not on treatment. And I would say it's pretty similar to our other cancer patients. It depends on what treatment plan they're on, how long they're going to be on it, and then what uh, the guidelines say as far as surveillance. So once patients are done with their treatment, there are certain guidelines out there which kind of tell us how often we should be seeing and, and doing imaging and lab work, et cetera. Uh, that's very important. I think, you know, it's from my point of view, it's always interesting to see who you need to follow, who you don't need to follow, and that right. makes a lot of sense. Right. You know, I think there's been a lot of change in the field of malignant hematology. Um, when, we, when we're when we treating leukemias nowadays, we're, we're seeing advancements in different uh, types of leukemia where we're not using chemotherapy quite as often. And we've seen that trend for uh, cancers like lung cancer and uh, to a degree breast cancer and some of the, the main cancers we see uh, on the solid malignancy side. So I think there's been a lot of advancements trying to um, personalize the approach to treatment and, and choose therapies which are very effective, which aren't chemotherapy just as we talked about in prior episodes. So, you know, what, what our group does well, I think, is is look at each case individually, send the appropriate testing that needs to be done, and also looking at our, our research protocols that we have available. And this is a shout out to our research team, too. I think we do an excellent job at screening patients and seeing who might benefit from a research trial. Because definitely on the hematology side of things, there's advancements made almost every year, almost more frequently than on the on the solid malignancy or solid tumor side. So we're we're oftentimes reviewing protocols in our research uh, meetings, you know, almost on an every other month basis, where there's new trials out there which I feel like can help patients with these with these diseases and we really I think do a good job at screening patients for those trials so it's something that I encourage patients to ask their doctors about you know if you do have a new uh, diagnosis of leukemia or lymphoma um, you know see a specialist like us we can kind of guide you and, and tell you what the latest treatments are out there and what protocols are available to you and even in benign Team, I, you know, we have trials open as well. We do. For some rare yeah, rarer there are, type diseases and things like that that I think patients who you may get diagnosed with something that's, you know, rare or scary, you know, there are options as well. So it's just pretty impressive the, the breadth of clinical trials we have. Yeah. there. Uh, you know, we're trying to get to a point where we have one trial open for almost every major disease out there that we treat. So, you know, one day we might reach that goal, but I think it's it's good to give people that option. Obviously, patients have the option to go with standard treatments or go on a clinical trial. Those are the two main options. But I think giving patients that option is 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 wonderful. How do you um, thinking about like multiple myeloma and smoldering myeloma and MGUS, which a lot of people seem to be carrying these diagnoses as we test more than we probably used to. Right. I think one of the hardest things it, from my perspective as a radiation oncologist that you guys have to make is sort of what are the, I know there's different calculators and other things you can look at and, but what's your kind of personal gestalt of someone comes into your office with MGUS for, is this someone you try to get ahead of with treatment versus, you know, realizing a lot of these guys you could watch and they'll never necessarily turn into something, you know, malignant. How do you kind of big picture approach those kind of patients 
Yeah, so what, what Dr. Rick's talking about here is AMGA stands for monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. That's why we don't... <laughs> <laughs> That's why we say MGUS. We don't say that whole long say phrase that five there. Times <laughs> best. Right. So um, just throw it, an idiopathic, and you've hit right. most of the buzzwords. Oh my so God. it's it's a very common consult in our clinic. We don't see that consult come too often in the hospital, but we get a lot of consults from primary care physicians about, or and sometimes neurologists and other specialists who do. Um, what we call serum protein studies, which identify an antibody, which is a protein in the blood, which um, shouldn't be there. It, it's uh, to diagnose MGUS, you need a abnormal antibody detected in in the blood on a blood test, and um, from from there on, we kind of do additional workup to see if this is related to a blood cancer or not. And so MGUS is, by, you know, by definition, a benign uh, disorder. It has the potential to turn into a malignant process or a cancer. D uh, Rick alluded to multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is a blood cancer, and it's an uh, overproduction of plasma cells, which produce antibody. So all MGUS is is an abnormal production of an antibody. It's usually one type of antibody. Uh, you could have situations where you're producing two different types and then we see those patients and do additional lab work. We also do urine tests, and we make sure that that antibody is not causing any problems to that patient. So the main problems we rule out is uh, kidney disease, uh, anemia. We make sure that it's not affecting their bones uh, to the point where it can weaken the bones and cause problems. Uh, sometimes we offer a bone marrow biopsy. So I tell patients, don't, don't get scared if I recommend a bone marrow biopsy. This is just to provide us with more reassurance that uh, there really isn't a blood cancer brewing and, and there's nothing else serious going on and it could be a good test to rule out a, a more serious condition. Um, so we do all of those tests to make sure that this antibody in the blood is not anything serious that we need to uh, treat the patient for. So over the years, really, these definitions of the benign condition, MGUS, uh, to myeloma, which is a more uh, is a cancer condition, uh, definitions have changed a little bit over the years. But I don't want to get into too much detail because it's it's kind of nuanced at how we diagnose it. But just be sure if you see a hematologist for this condition, we're we're doing these tests, these extra blood tests, these extra uh, sometimes urine and even bone marrow biopsy. Uh, test to make sure that you don't have cancer. Uh, but just by definition alone, MGUS is not cancer. It's uh, a benign condition, which may have the potential to turn into cancer over time. Uh, the estimates over the history have been about 1% of patients with MGUS per year may, may turn into multiple myeloma. Uh, so that's why we follow these patients usually every six months to once a year and repeat those antibody levels just to make sure they don't turn into anything more scary. There are other conditions, actually, you know, conditions of the white blood cells, which uh, are similar to MGUS, where you may be producing a abnormal white blood cell, which has the potential to turn into a type of leukemia. And it's pretty similar in terms of how we go about monitoring it. We'll do blood work once or twice a year. We'll check those levels. We'll make sure that it's not causing your body any undue harm. And uh, I think for those conditions where you have either an abnormal white blood cell or an abnormal antibody, you see a hematologist because they really know what the appropriate test is to order and, and to follow over time to make sure you don't develop cancer in the future. I think that's the hardest part is there's, there seems to be a lot of nuance, which mm -hmm. is why you got to see somebody who deals with nuance. Who does it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it certainly is. And it's overwhelming. I mean, you know, these tests that, that we order um, – even interpretation of the test is challenging sometimes. So, <laughs> you know, I think it's, uh, but it, it's something we see all the time. And so we're very comfortable doing it. Anyone at our practice who sees hematology patients on a regular basis uh, is, is trained to do this. I think that's very helpful. So, you know, Rick, when a patient comes to see us, um, you know, oftentimes they're, they're asking me, you know, if I order a big set of labs, you know, where should they go and should they... Um, you know, see their primary to get all these labs done. And, you know, we have the luxury at pretty much all of our practices to do the lab work right in-house. 
and sometimes get the, the result immediately uh, within about 15 minutes. And that's true for when we're checking patients' blood counts and when we send off more of these sophisticated lab tests. Um, you know, I think it's important when you see a hematologist, we're going to order labs which aren't commonly done in a primary care clinic and, and some other specialty clinics. So um, I think it's, it's, it's very useful to have uh, lab capability here to send off the specialized lab tests and to consult patients on what those results mean and, and, and how, how we can uh, guide them at what their, their next steps are in their treatment plan. So um, I just want to make patients aware that when you see a, a hematologist at any cancer specialist location, you know, we're going to do your labs in-house and we're going to have um, the capability to send out specialized lab tests, which are important for whatever diagnosis or condition you're coming in with. And we'll be able to interpret those results in a, in a second meeting. Usually, you know, during the uh, coronavirus pandemic, I set up a lot of telemedicine visits to kind of, you know, uh, go over those lab results and kind of consult patients on what the significance of those findings are. And so um, it could be in, in person, it could be virtual, and, and we'll go over those results. And um, I think that we have a great, great capability to do the lab work in-house as well as um, one special test called flow cytometry we actually do at our central lab, which is a very sophisticated, you know, hematology uh, test where we send the patient's blood and, and run through a flow cytometer and actually tell patients if they have any abnormal white blood cells circulating in their system. And we can give the patient's results sometimes the next day with those uh that test and and we do that in house so I think it's uh, the capabilities we have here are, are great and I think we're expanding our our rep repertoire of uh, machines and and new testing that's coming out um, we're even talking about at our retreat about you know getting new technology here so we can run next generation sequencing potentially in the in the practice so I think very exciting for patients that we can get all these tests done in-house. Yeah, I think it just makes things easier when they show up. They get blood work, then they wait not a long time and get in right to see you. And you can review some of the CBC and some of that stuff almost instantaneously. I think it's a big benefit to patients versus having to drive somewhere to get the blood work, drive home, yeah. drive to the doctor. So it's, it makes things a lot easier. And the lab results come directly to us via an inbox. So it's electronically, once the lab result gets uh, reported, it comes directly to us. It come, usually our medical assistant or, or nurse working with us will get the result as well. So if we don't see it immediately, one of them usually will notify us or the patient. Um, and yeah, we'll be able to set up appointments pretty much right afterwards if, if the result isn't back, you know, immediately. So, Danny, I understand that from Brenna told me that we actually have a couple of listener emails that aren't her parents. It's amazing, Rick. I'm so excited. I think you're holding one of them. Do you want to read it to us and we'll try to answer it? Assuming Definitely. there's a question in there. I don't know. I have not I seen these so. ahead let's, of time. Let's, let's read over Maybe here. Maybe I should have. So Dr. Rick and Dr. Danny, very good information today. Alicia Sugarman is my doctor and I love her. We love her too. Yeah. We're in her office right now. We are in her office, yes. She inherited me from left them mid chemo and i'm so glad i did no no comment but I, i'm reading on here <laughs> I'll leave it out. I'll leave it out. <laughs> um i am finished with chemo and radiation and now starting the chemo pill i'm having rapid and irregular heart rates which have increased after chemotherapy dr sugarman is working with me to find the best pill to take cancer specialist in north florida is much more personable caring thorough and so much more accessible than my stress level has dropped to zero since, switch, since I switched to CSNF. I look forward to your podcast and share them on my Facebook. Looking forward to part two. My best, Marion. Wow, I just, sorry, I just had to make sure that wasn't <laughs> a, a, a plug for the company. That, thank you very much thank for that you, email. Marianne. Yes, very, very kind email. And yeah, we, uh, I work with Dr. Sugarman here at the Peach office and I love working with her. I think you're in great hands. And, um, you know, I think, I think Rick and I strive to do what kind of what you said every day is to be personable, caring, and take as much time as, as we need to, um, give patients, you know, the best shot at curing their cancer if we're able to, or giving them a 
a better quality of life. So I, I appreciate your comments. Well, I have no doubt, Danny, you're very kind and personal. But my only question is when you are in a room with patients and are telling so many dad jokes, how do you get to the meat of That's what true. you actually need to talk about? I reserve my dad jokes for you, Rick. Oh, so okay. My okay. patients are spared. Gotcha. 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 <laughs> spared. <laughs> well, no, thank you. Thank you for the kind email. And um, I think it's it sounds like a broken record, but I think that's the what our company strives to be is accessible and personable. And, you know, you actually getting to see your doctor and getting to know them, you know, face to face and seeing it in a much more intimate setting while still having access to all the latest and greatest and bells and whistles. So it's a very kind and, and happy to hear people feel that way. Thank you, Mary. Well, thanks so much for coming back and joining us for another episode of the Medical Minute. If you have any suggestions on things we should talk about, questions you'd like answered, or you just want to say hi, please email us at medicalminute at csnf.us. And make sure you follow us on social media. Search Cancer Specialists of North Florida on Facebook and underscore CSNF on Twitter and Instagram. As always, we appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time, and we hope you learned something today. And remember, when it comes to your health, stay informed. Ask questions and, and tune, tune in next time. time. I always got to flip the page. <laughs>